Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gwen Musqua. I am the Treaty Relations Coordinator for Treaty 8, and I've been with the organization for 25 years. I am from Big Stone Cree Nation. Uh, so the work that I do um, is very critical because the whole mandate of our organization is the protection of treaty, right? And trying to implement the true spirit and intent as told to us by our elders. So I've been very fortunate to work with our elders council over, over these years and their knowledge, wis wisdom, expertise and guidance has guided me in my work uh, as I move things forward. And we've lost so many of our elder um, treaty knowledge keepers over the years, right? So in everything that we do in our work, I'm always thinking about those elders that I have learned from and to try bring some honor uh, to their legacy that they wanted to see come to be. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me. I'm a mom, I adopted two beautiful babies. Um, and uh, what else is about me? I'm pretty much a homebody. <laughs> COVID really, uh, uh, now everything's too peoply for me to go outside. No. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Margo to introduce herself. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. I Thank you. Uh, first off, and I'm going to ask you about Jesse. Jesse, I'm going to ask you about the big square. So, in my language, I just want to say that I acknowledge the uh, elders who started us off with the prayer this morning. Uh, my name is Margot Oje. Uh, I work with Gwen. Gwen uh, basically has been working for the Treaty Chiefs Organization since it started 25 years ago. I am a chief administrative officer. I worked, we work directly for the chiefs. And so basically I'm the one who operates, administers their office. Uh, and we have a small team. Um, and as Gwen mentioned, we do a lot of um, protection of our inherent treaty rights. And it's a lot of political advocacy. So we work directly for Grand Chief Noski and the sovereign nations. I'm from uh, Big Stone Cree Nation. Uh, and you heard I, I do speak my language. I'm a mother of three, a very, very young grandmother of one, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm a wife. Uh, so I have a very, very busy life, and since I started working for Treaty 8, I have uh, not seen my family much, just so you know. The presentation that we do really, really ties in with what Sharon spoke about earlier. Uh, and so you're going to be able to see it because we're very, very visual people. We want to be able to show this uh, presentation. It's really going to tie in. I want to talk about before treaty. So yes, we are treaty peoples, but why were we able to enter into treaty? When we say we're sovereign nations, why do we say that? Before treaty, I acknowledge myself, I identify myself as a big stone Cree nation, Nihio Isku. I am not an Albertan. I am not Canadian. I am a Nihio school from Big Stone Cree Nation. That is who I am. That's my identity. We have the Denesinale and Nihio peoples in Treaty 8. I'm only going to talk a little bit about what's now, we're really, really trying to get out of differentiating ourselves with the provinces. So we work for the 23 nations within Alberta boundary. Uh, but we are working in alliance with all of the Treaty 8 nations located within BC, Northwest Territories, and Saskatchewan. We have inherent rights. Now, what does that mean? Inherent rights, we're born with them. It's in the blood. It came with us when we were born. That's not anything that can be taken away by any monarchy, by any government by any province. It wasn't taken away by any Indian agents. Seven generations after the uh, entering of Treaty Number 8, I still know, I know who I am now <laughs> since I've been decolonized by our elders and Grand Chief Noski and Gwen. We have, uh, we've always managed our livelihood. So when Sharon, Sharon was talking earlier about, you know, that ceremony, the traditional governance, that natural laws, we still have that. 
It's just that from generation to generation, we haven't really communicated or educated our own people about it, but it's still there. We know it. We're sovereign peoples of the land. That's who we are. We have the natural laws and all that inhabited. So when you think about this, we talk about the land. You see this a lot, especially with this, uh, this infamous provincial government these days. Everything connects us to that land. That is who we are. We have those inherent rights. So that's who we were before treaty. That's who we still are today. Click. <laughs> when our ancestors entered into treaty, it was under this understanding. And this is why, and I understand that there's some lawyers here today. It's pretty cool, right? We work with our own Nihio lawyers as well. The difference with our Nihio lawyers is that they know who we are and they know our inherent rights and they know our treaty rights. However, because they are bound or, uh, you know, they, they, what is it called? Where you go into a bar, you swear an oath for the Canadian Constitution. You know, that's, that's a difference, right? So, but this is the understanding. The British Crown, the sovereign nations entered into treaty with the British Crown eye to eye. That is the level of authority and jurisdiction the nations have. You see that language quite a bit in what's coming out of the treaty office. So when you see the media releases, the statements that Grand Chief Arthur Noski makes, that's what he's talking from, that sovereignty. Who here is First Nation? Your royalty. That is what? That is the highest level of authority we have. It's just we've never, we've never been taught this, right? Because we were assimilated and colonized into a process, into a system, into a structure that is not ours. So the day of the treaty, the understanding, the signatories to the treaty number eight in particular, well, I'll talk a little bit about treaty number eight, uh, a little bit, mostly about treaty number eight, but it's the same, it's true spirit and intent. And then the British Crown. So when her Indian agents came to be, it was a little different for Treaty Number 8. I won't get into that. But there was this conversation, this agreement, our oral history and understanding. We haven't lost that. Those treaty promises. Why? Why do we have those treaty promises? So that the queen at the time, her subjects, the monarchy, her settlers could come and share the lands with us in peace and friendship. However, it was also to be, the understanding is that we were to benefit in the bounty and benevolence of the queen for sharing those lands and settlements. It is written in our documents, that is about one of the few things that we will agree to, uh, what the commissioners wrote, what Canada uses, what the, what the lawyers use, but it's always that inter interpretation, right? And they can't change our oral, her oral history because here I am seven generations later and I'm saying the same thing they're saying. There was a number of promises. So we talk about those promises, education, health. Those were all on the table. There's a new bill that came out federally today uh, or today or yesterday. It's the one about the guns. I'm like, my God, you guys. Treaty, treaty relationship, when we talk about that, what are we saying? Bullets were to be supplied. They're really not honoring the treaty promises. And why? Well, we'll get into that. It was supposed to be in that peace and friendship. So Gwen, be that first peoples. You see that handshake? You see it all over the place? Come shake my hand, girl. <laughs> that was what the agreement was. We will coexist. What's the problem? They never honored it, never. 123 years later for us, a treaty, treaty eight, they haven't honored it, click. You see there that uh, in, in red, it said, um, how did the crown obtain title? You heard Sharon speak, they don't have title. She's so correct, they don't. The colonial timeline, so what happened? You've also heard recently, and things came out even more so through the 215 Kamloops um, discovery. I'm not going to say discovery because we knew they were there. We know our, our, our people always knew that our children didn't make it home. Click. 
You're going to be clicking here quite a bit. Sharon spoke about the doctrine of discovery. I'm not sure about your speakers the last couple of days because we've been very, very busy. Didn't get a chance to come and listen to the awesome speakers. But there was a papal bull. It was this policy decreed by the Pope. You saw this as well. Some of this came out in uh, the recent, you know, when the Pope come to visit. Treaty 8 nations really just, uh, some of them went, you know, in honor and uh, just to support their elders, those who uh, believe in the symbolism of the Pope. But you also saw Grand Chief uh, with the uh, press releases and why, why our conversations, our discussions were you had to uh, basically rescind that doctrine of discovery. Doctrine of discovery, Terra Nullis, what does it all mean? 1492-93. It's this. This is exactly what they did, basically. Cleo, Cleo, and I'm going to answer your question later on about uh, AFN. I found your purse. You left it there. I, I, it's mine now. I discovered it. <laughs> Therefore, it's mine. Right? That's what they did with our land. That's what they did with us. But what, did they, what else did they say? What else was in that language? So you're going to see me move around because I'm not really somebody who stands still and I'm not a very quiet person. They basically said... So, you know, when they discovered the land over here and then they went back to the Spain, Spain monarchy at the time and said, there's savages over there. What do we do? Well, what did they do? They created this papal bull and said, they are not Christians as they understand it, as, as Christians as, as they were. Um, they're heathens. They're not human beings. Therefore, they do not matter, basically. They do not exist. Terra Nullis says that they come and discovered this vacant land. It wasn't vacant. The archaeologists have so showed that, right? That's what that means. That still exists. Why is it important, even though it says 1492, 1493? Because they're using it in the law courts today. They're still using it today. Click. The Royal Proclamation, I'm not going to go into, like, there's a lot of legislation, and it's really, really gross, you know, how they all come in, thought that they come and own this land. But what did they do with us? You know, when we present this to our own peoples, our own students, they ask, why didn't our ancestors fight? Why? Well, it's because they boxed us into all this legislation. They didn't let us off of our reserves. They put us on our reserves. They weren't supposed to be on reserves. Pardon me, Gwen? We weren't allowed to hire lawyers, right? And we sure have a lot of them now. In fact, our own people are lawyers. But what happened it was a royal, royal proclamation. Even though it says 1763, that still matters today. Why? Why does it matter, Gwen? Land, lands reserved, not preserved. Preserved. Did you hear that? It says we have aboriginal title to our lands and territories. That still exists. The only thing is it's been interpreted, misinterpreted, interpreted, misinterpreted. Every single time we go to court for, court, for our lands, our resources, our waters, etc. Click. You know, I also want to add in a royal proclamation. That was intended, actually, I'll, I'll go into it again a little bit more of the history here. But there was a seven-year war. You know, when we're in social studies, you're taught, you're taught that this is how it is. So I thought, you know, I have a governance background. I'm a land use planner by trade as well. So I thought, oh, man, I know, like, I, I know I'm a, this Canadian. I know the Canadian laws. And I worked for a municipality as lands and planning manager, and I'm managing all these lands. And I thought, oh, my God, I kind of work for Treaty 8. You know, I went and worked for industry for five, six years. I have an oil sands background as well, so I have an understanding. And I thought, man, I know this stuff. I come to work for Treaty and like, oh my God, what was I doing, right? I was managing our territory on behalf of the municipalities and the province and the process, not realizing who I was. When we talk about that royal proclamation, that seven-year war, King George III at the time came back and said, we ceded the lands and territory from Spain but we didn't seed the Indians. When I say seed, it's C-E-D-E. 
The irony, right? Our ancestors fought with British, the Britons. They won. Now we have this, this monarchy here, this British monarchy. But we didn't cede our lands either. So, you know, like where did you get title from? You might have won the war with Spain. You didn't cede anything. But, but thank you still. Your royal proclamation is still beneficial to us. Johnson versus McIntosh is one of the uh, case law in um, the states that ties into the doctrine of discovery and the royal proclamation. That's why we include it in here is because it's still utilized even though it says 1823 was very significant. Everything ties into who we are, our lands, our territory, our people. Click. The Gradual Civilization Act, the 1869 Enfranchisement Act. <laughs> I can't say that word with my Cree tongue. But they created a whole bunch of legislation and what I didn't include in here, you know, we talk about citizenship and membership. Of all the nationalities that are in Canada today, what's known as Canada today, we are the only peoples that have an act on us that tells us who we are. And as we make children, as we make grandchildren, still to this day they're determining how much bloodline, treaty bloodline is in our children, our grandchildren, etc. Still to this day, 2022. Those acts were combined. So there's, they're, they're, you know, like even the words themselves, gradual civilization, enfranchise, enfranchise. I can't say that word. But you know what they mean, right? They're going to gradually civilize those Indians so that they become one of us, that they become part of our society, of our system. And uh, we're going to trick them, you know. Uh, we're going to let them go fight for our lands and go into war, but we're going to franchi and, and franchise them. Oh, I hate that word. <laughs> but basically, they started taking our rights away in any way they could. But you know, when you talk to some of our elders today and you hear and you say, well, yeah, we signed script, but it was with the understanding because I know who I am, my inherent and treaty rights. I didn't think I was going to lose those kinds of rights when they come and made me sign it because you can't take that away from me. It's inherent, right? What was this on the conversations? Then they had this BNA Act, and that's when this whole Dominion of Canada came to be. Again, it's taught different in our schools, right? I, my kids have a kid in grade 11 right now, and he's not learning it the way I'm teaching it. They create all these sections, and this is kind of a conversation today with this Sovereignty Act, right? Click. But you also see what never changed here as well. And I, I am only for this one, just for this particular presentation, including when the uh, treaty number six sovereign nations entered into treaty, 1875. When the treaty seven nations, sovereign nations entered into treaty, 1876. And when we entered 1899, it was with the British monarchy. It was not with Canada. Just so you know. 1876 Indian Act, even though these dates refer to hundreds of years ago, this is still relevant. This is that act I was talking about. Sure, it's been amended and amended and amended and amended, but it still exists. That tells us, did you guys know, that that act still to this day determines how we will have a chief and council how structure, how we will have, uh, how we'll operate and administer. And by the way, this is how you'll operate and administer your, your band with these limited funds. By the way, we're holding your funds. We'll determine how much you get. By the way, you can make this bylaw, self-determination, self-governance, but it's not within our system, not the way we understood it. And if you don't, if you don't, we're going to hold your money from you. And by the way, we're still controlling your lands, your resources. By the way, we're still creating all these acts and legislation. And you guys go be good Indians until we assimilate you even further and get rid of your treaty territory. Click. You know, it's also interesting. Me as a woman, as a, uh, can one of the male First Nations people who has status or treaty rights hold your hand up, please? Is there anybody here? You have more rights than I do as a woman, still to this day. Still to this day. In fact, you know what they didn't amend? You and I are not supposed to go into pool halls. 
That's still in there. You know, the other thing as well, not that we have pool halls anymore. They're a little different now these days, right? But that's still in there. They didn't amend, even though they shut down the last residential school in 1996, that is still in their Indian Act. They can still go ahead and start up their own residential schools again. 1878 was when that uh, first Prime Minister of Canada came to be. Uh, and of course, you know, that's the one that's been famous for starting up and ensuring that the uh, industrial schools took place. And when it got too expensive for the Dominion of Canada, they started the residential schools. And then they come and brought us some poison and, uh, you know, um, Spanish flu came to be. Still couldn't kill us off. Let's adopt them out. 60 scoop. Let's just do everything we can to try and get rid of these Indians. And now today, it still exists. It's called CFS, Children Family Services. Alberta government won't let go of our kids. And I'll get into that. The other one here is 1889, St. Catharines, Milling and Lumber. Again, that one, that one actually was in Canada, and it all ties in again. It, talks, it ties into the Doctrine of Discovery. And that, uh, that, that policy, you know, that says that we are not humans. Click. 1905, isn't this, did you see this? You saw our, you saw <laughs> our media releases? 1905 is when Alberta came to be. 1905. Look at those treaties there, 1875, 1876, 1899. They are still alive. They still exist. We've been sharing the land. We keep sharing the land. How much more do we have to share the land? Alberta government. 1930 Natural Resources Transfer Act. That's another one. So all that time, while they're, you know, they didn't allow us to go to court, didn't allow us to go out to have legal representation, they, they became to be this province, and they're going to start managing the lands, the waters, the resources, trap lines all of a sudden. You know, we, that's one of our inherent rights. It's not a treaty right, it's an inherent right. They negotiated with the Dominion of Canada and said, hey, this province is rich in natural resources. We want to be able to manage them, to profit off of them, and we'll share with you Canada. 20-some years, but they did it, and they passed it, and they passed it without the treaty people. Click. Some of the case law, I'm not going to get into them, but the Calder versus Attorney General, uh, that's uh, BC, recognizes Aboriginal title, 1973. Now you start to see what happened. Finally, we were allowed to hire a lawyer in the 60s, late 60s, it was about. I wasn't even thought of then. Click. Guerin versus, versus the Queen recognized pre-existing Aboriginal, Aboriginal rights both on and off reserve. Because you got to remember, too, they couldn't kill us off, so we're going to legislate them to death. We'll legislate them on the reserves, keep them on the reserves. Have you ever wondered why we say we're supposed to be tax-free? Does anybody know why we're supposed to be tax-free? Think about that. I'll tell you why later. Keep going, Gwen. R versus Sparrow recognizes, Regina versus Sparrow recognizes Aboriginal rights. The existing Aboriginal treaty rights of the Ager Aboriginal peoples of Canada, it says. We are not Canada's Aboriginals. Click. Dalgamuk versus Gizde confirms Aboriginal title, 1997. Click. I'm not going to get into them. I just want to show that how many times do we have to take your Canadian government to court, your provincial governments to court to understand, to see? We own the land. Your own case law affirms that. Your own royal proclamation affirms that. Haida versus BC. Again, that was another title one. Uh, forestry. Taku River versus BC. The duties of consultation accommodation with respect to government decision. This is, this is cool, right? This is starting to come out. Click. Duty to consult. Mikasu First Nation versus Canada. That is a treaty eight nation. What's so interesting about this? What happened? I used to work for the government of Alberta. <laughs> um, and so I learned a lot there. I had some colleagues. But what happened? I didn't realize I was my, uh, my boss at the time that I was in the uh, government of Alberta. I happened to be one of the pre-writers of this consultation policy, First Nations consultation policy established at Alberta government. 
First Nation. Just because they called it First Nation doesn't mean it's ours. Canada does that too. So what they do, they didn't know, well, how do we know which Indians to consult with? So they went back to the nations and they said, hey, send us your maps, your traditional land use territories, so we know who. Some of the nations are pretty smart. They submitted a whole map of Canada, <laughs> south of the United States, because they knew what was going on, right? But they could also chase, they could also follow their ancestry. Some of the nations should have, at the very, very minimum, used their treaty boundaries, right, to the very minimum. Click. R versus Marshall, Marshall confirms Aboriginal interests are burden of the crowns. If you hear me speak a little different as well, I think in Cree, so when I present, you're going to see my English is not the greatest. Click. Rio Tinto versus BC Mines, 2010. It confirmed the Haida test of when the duty to consult arises. So we're telling you guys, we keep winning. You have to consult with us because we're the landowners. How many times do we have to go to court? Click. Chicotan Nation versus BC. And even though these things took place in BC, it doesn't matter with these provinces, right? Even though that's the court structure that's set up today, it doesn't matter. Those territories are still there intact. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be sharing the lands. Click. This is another cool one. This happened just two years ago. Not too many people are familiar with this one. Fort Mackay, which is another Treaty 8 nation, versus Prosper Energy versus Alberta Energy Regulator, 2020. Just two years ago. Just about three now. This was a situation where, and I happened to be working with, at Alberta government when uh, it was our ministry. I was working for Indigenous Relations. And the ministry that I was working for, in fact, the department I was working for, was actually in conversations and discussions for over 19 years at the time with Fort Mackay. And Fort Mackay did a land use plan and said, you know what? You know Fort Mackay is in one of the uh, nations which are in uh, north, what's known as northeast of uh, Alberta today. It's in Treaty 8 territory. It's where all the oil sands activities taking place. They have one area of land called Moose Lake, and they don't have to protect that. It's the only one that's left intact. I can't say that it's totally pristine because there are no boundaries in air when it comes to contamination and cumulative effects, right? So what happened? Well, Alberta government decided, Alberta Energy Regulator, even though they had a buffer, they had a buffer on that lake that said there'll be no development within this buffer of this lake. Alberta government went ahead and approved a permit to prosper within that buffer. Fort Mackay said, oh, I've got no choice. Even though we've been working with you guys for how many years, we did a land use plan. It's ours. It's under our law. You went ahead and approved it. Let's go to court. And they won. They won. Why did they win? And look at this. Is, this is what's important. But I'm going to tell you, like, this is why I don't sleep much at night in my job, right? Because it's so gross what we have to live with as Indians. The honor of the crown extends beyond the duty to consult. You know what that means? It means it's not just a matter of, hey, let's talk about this. You know, we're going to have this, this uh, application, and we're going we're to allow it to happen. And maybe I can give your, your nation some, I don't know, labor jobs or, uh, you know, what, whatever, right? <laughs> let's, let's give you guys some monies for your treaty days, right? And, and we're going to call that consultation. It's beyond that. That's what they said. It's beyond that. It's not just a matter of consultation. You have to act in a manner that advances the intended purpose of treaty number eight. Treaty number eight. I'm talking about that actual treaty territory, right? We were there first. That still exists. That agreement is still live. And regulatory agencies such as Alberta Energy Regula Regulatories or Regulator, whatever the name is, is obligated to consider impacts on the inherent and treaty rights case law 2020. What did Indigenous Relations say? What did Minister Savage say? What did Forestry say? What did Alberta Environment say? Oh, that's only, um, you know what that means there, uh, Treaty 8? It means that it's only within the Moose Lake. That's where we have to abide. Site-specific. Don't be dumb. We have people now who uh, know and understand and can comprehend law. We have our own lawyers. We know what that means. And have you ever forgotten 
We have an ability to think now. You know, you assimilated us, you colonized us, we're speaking your language, we're reading your kinds of curriculum. But I have my own understanding, and you can't take that away from me. So no, it's not site-specific. It's all treaty number eight, regardless of your boundaries, your provincial boundaries. Quick. Uh, it's important that many of the nations, especially the nations that are now within Alberta, know and understand that particular case because it's to your advantage too. Blueberry First Nation is another nation. Uh, it's another case where there was, uh, over the years, the BC government, so it's a, it's a treaty eight nation, uh, there was a number of, uh, like, the industry kept developing and developing, and BC government kept approving and approving. And it got to the point where it was total treaty infringement. They had to go to court, and they won. Cumulative effects. We talk about cumulative effects. What are we talking about? You heard me say this word a little bit here earlier when there was no boundary in air, no boundary when it comes to contamination, pollution, waters, right? They lost a lot of their ability to live the life of treaty, the freedom of treaty. We're supposed to be able to live our lives as though we never entered into treaty. And what does that mean? What did they say? Well, a BC government wouldn't uh, take it to Supreme Court. They said, okay, all right, we admit. Why didn't they take it to Supreme Court? Any lawyers here think, why did they not take that to Supreme Court? Come on, why do you think? Yeah, well, it's because they lost it at the provincial level and you take it to Supreme Court and Supreme, Supreme Court has to, has to take a look at that and say, holy crap, that's got to apply to all the provinces, right? Isn't that how their Canadian Constitution works, the Canadian process, right? The delegated authority, section 91, 91 92. Click. It's no wonder why they're trying to do an Alberta Sovereignty Act, right? Makkwe sovereignty. Makkwe means nothing. Southland versus Canada is another case that just recently uh, transpired last year. This is also very significant, even though it's within the pre-Confederation Treaty, so the treaties that occurred uh, uh, before there was this dominion of Canada. There was a flooding that took place in a reserve, and literally that nation um, lost its land and territory and was pushed out. They went to court, they won, and they found, uh, and they were successful because you know, they created a dam and it really um, took away the livelihood of this nation. And they want equitable compensation taken for indigenous land. What does that mean? So you see, it's still happening. We're still winning, but nope. Here's treaties 1 to 11, treaty areas. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to show you. Treaties 1 to 11, treaty 8. So this is an international treaty. They're different. Today, you hear the word indigenous. Every time this government's change, they give us a new name. Indigenous means they're going to loop in all the treaty Indians, all the First Nations, the First Peoples, with the Inuits, with the Métis, put them all in one big basket and treat them all the same. And then this way we can sort through the money's piece and see how we can continue colonizing and controlling them. The Robinson here in Treaties, the William Treaties, those are all the pre-confederation treaties. That case I talked about is, took place here in this region. Treaties 1 to 7 happened within, Treaties 1 to 6 actually happened within six years, really, really fast. Boom, 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 year after year after year. Does anybody know why? If you've heard me, does anybody know why? It took... 22 years before Treaty 7 and Treaty 8 was entered into? Does anybody know why? What is it about Treaty 8 people? <laughs> what is it about Treaty 8 that makes it so special and different? It's not just because of the beautiful people in it. <laughs> Resources. Gold, right? Klondike Rush. They were after. They knew what was in the ground. But you got to go back to our treaty because our ancestors knew too. And they said, we are only entering treaty into a depth of a plow. We did not give away our natural resources. Mineral rights retained. How many of you own land in a city or a town? You know, it comes with a, you have a land title. How many have own land, land title? Have you ever read your land title? It says, I'm just going to say, I'm going to pretend, Margot Oje. Plan, block, lot. 
title owner, accepting their oath, all mines and minerals. Why do you think it says that? Right? Click. Oh, by the way, when you go back to that, treaties 1 to 11, that land base, you know how big that is, of what encompasses of what Canada thinks, uh, Canada thinks it owns today? That's 65% of the land. 65%. Okay, click. I want to just show you this map here a little bit, just to show, going back to the Royal Proclamation, a little bit of that. But I also want to show you how, and you might have seen this in the internet. It's been all over social media. Sylvia McAdam, who uh, is an awesome presenter. You got to hear her. Her Cree is so awesome. She shared this. So 1655, you see how all the uh, indigenous land, indigenous. <laughs> Did we just talk about this? Yeah. Their lands. Our lands and territories, we owned 9 to 7.2%. And all of a sudden, like, you see there's a little bit of a new France up there. Like, oh, okay. New France, remember Spain? They got into a, f uh, a war with, I just was said fight, with Great Britain. And then, uh, and then in 1763, significant, 1763, they won. So we're in school and social studies, we're taught, we're taught that uh, you know, the seven-year war took place, but this is all you have to memorize. And that is how come we have a British monarchy. That's what you're taught in social studies. But you know what we're teaching our people, we're teaching Canadians and Albertans today? That is our land. The Royal Proclamation affirms that that is our land. We didn't see the, t the people. They have Aboriginal title to the territory lands. 1871, why is that significant there as well? You see how there's this little square here is because one of the treaty territories at the time, one, two, and three, one of them wouldn't uh, saw, enter into treaty right away because they knew what was going on. They waited, and then they, uh, and that was about the times was taking place. But 1871 is also significant because that's the time when there was this Dominion of uh, Lands uh, Surveys Act. I forget what it's called, but that's when they started to come and survey the land. That's when they started and created that act. And all of a sudden, you see Great Britain has a little land. Now, it's all of a sudden, there's like a Dominion of Canada all of a sudden. So you start to see legislation, you're wondering, we're talking to our, our own students, our own people, like, where were our ancestors? Why didn't they fight? Where were our ancestors? We talked about this. Today, look at that. They refer to this 0.2% indigenous lands. Reserves. That is not our land. It's the territories. Remember that 65% I mentioned? But you know what's going on today? Baby Trudeau is implementing his dad's white paper. And uh, along with the provinces, you talk about the Sovereignty Act, they're all after our lands. They're trying to make all of those little green little dots into municipalities. That's what they're doing. Click. Let's go back to this. Remember when I asked, why are we not supposed to be paying taxes? Did the queen pay taxes her whole time? She's sovereign. Does the monarchy pay taxes? Right? Sovereign to sovereign. That's why it's in our treaty. We're not supposed to pay taxes. It doesn't matter if you put me on a reserve. A lot of us have been paying land taxes, property taxes, all kinds of sale taxes. The irony, right? We've shared the land with you and you're making us pay for it, and then you're making us pay taxes on top of it, right? Oh, and by the way, we're not going to let you manage it as well. There was a question here a little earlier today about uh, why is Treaty 8 um, very positional when it comes to the Assembly of First Nations, AFN. AFN is an, was an advocacy, was an advocacy organization, administrative organization that was supposed to uh, support and advocate, but it was supposed to support and advocate from the direction of the sovereign nation leaders. And what happened? Well, baby Trudeau in his, in his uh, devolution of treaties process, his rights and recognition framework process, what did he do? They signed an MOU agreement with the Assembly of First Nations and what that MOU agreement said basically is that uh, you are our one-stop shop, distinction-based process. We will co-develop everything with you. We're going to co-develop your health laws, your language laws, your land laws, 
There's like 34 things that they're co-developing without us. Remember? Sovereign nations. We didn't delegate our authority, our decision-making, our jurisdiction to an organization that doesn't come and meet with us. And what are you doing, AFN? The work that you're doing at that level nationally with Canada is taking away the jurisdiction and authority from the very, very first nations that created that organization. That's why things are so gross is because your Canadian government keeps creating process after process after process. See, you notice I didn't really refer to any parties because it doesn't matter what parties are in there. It's the system, the system of governance. I spoke about Section 91, 92. That's, remember, the Alberta Sovereignty Within a Canada Act? What happens to Section 91, 92 if you're going to decide? You know, those are delegated constitutionally delegated powers and authority that we're giving you, Alberta, says Canada. All right, oh my God, we're not even anywhere near there. <laughs> the AFN is sitting at that level with Canada and our nations are over here. This is where we're supposed to be. You talked when we heard Sharon talk about the governance, our natural laws. You see on the top there, creator. She talked about ceremony. That's the relationship, ceremony. We manage ourselves. We talk about hunting, fishing, trapping, gathering. You hear they're called, called treaty rights, but it's actually our inherent rights. That was that sharing of lands. Livelihood for livelihood. We're not supposed to alter the way of life. It was supposed to be, we're going to coexist, we're going to co-live as though we never entered treaty. That was the agreement. That's what she's saying over here. So we talk about hunting, fishing, trapping. Click, Gwen. I'm not going to go into this at all because I only got less than five minutes. I am kind of going fast now. <laughs> but this is Alberta government has a bunch of dirt ministries. And what do they do? Under their, that's actually what they call them. Um, and so under their regulations, they took, they decided what, treaty means they decided what treaty rights are they decided what the impacts are to the treaty rights and they came up with their own measurement without the treaty people and then what did they do they created this aboriginal consultation office they created all these policies but then they took hunting fishing trapping and gathering and they put them under their regulations and defined them as recreation my way of life is not recreation that's the problem click this is how they manage our territory. Again, I'm not going to go into this is Alberta. They call this thing green land, crown land, public lands, and they're creating all these task force committees. They're managing and planning our lands without us, with the municipalities, with industry, without us. There are no such thing as crown lands. It's treaty territory land. Treaty 8 encompasses the majority of Alberta and goes right into the mountains. Jasper, right to Lake Louise, within Alberta. And then, then it goes into Northwest Territory, Saskatchewan, and Man uh, BC. So they're making all these laws, regulations, etc., and they're doing it without us. That's the problem. We're talking about water. They're doing this without us. That's not, that's not what we agreed on. We didn't agree for you to manage us. You can't manage the animals. Click. This is what they do. This is Canada. Remember that treaty relationship? We're supposed to coexist. What, what did the highest level of Cal, pro, the province here say, the courts say, under Fort Mackay? You have to work with the treaty nations, treaty number eight. It has to be for the intended purpose of treaty number eight. Does that look like that's what they're doing? Click, historically? Click, my dear. Bill C-69, click, see, see, they just ignored the treaty relationship. The Canadian Navigable Waters Act, click. Indian Act, click. Do you think we would have entered uh, treaties to share the land if we knew they were going to control, manage, and dictate who we are? Nope, that was never the purpose. Provincially, they do this too. This particular government implemented a bunch of Red Tape Reduction Implementation Act. Do you want to know what the Red Tape Reduction is? The Indians are the red tape. Everything and anything that says the duty to consult Take it out, take it out, take it out. Red tape, red tape, they're red tape. Natural Resources Transfer Act, illegal. 
It is legal. Eee, just what Bill, quick. Bill 1, Alberta Sovereignty Act. Did you know when you look in there, they defined us? Aboriginal peoples of Canada? Get us out of your act. You're not, I'm not part of Alberta. And I'm not part of Canada. I'm not the Aboriginal, am I by the Aboriginal peoples? Because you're calling me indigenous. But in the U.S., they're calling us creatures. What are we, right? We're the first peoples. We're the Nihil. Click. That was my presentation really fast. I didn't get into it. I'm not going to show, like, uh, the Treaty 8 uh, nations have been working united, and they are actually working collectively on our lands and territories. There's a lot of education and awareness going on out there, and we're trying to protect what's right rightfully ours, our lands, our waters, our resources, and our territory. We can create this governance system similar to what Canada has done, what Alberta government has done. We can assert that. We'll entertain your constitutions. And I don't mean like entering as in, I'm going to abide by your Canadian constitution. We have our own. We have our own. We have our natural laws. So we know who we are. And that's, that's the situation, right? When you think about this, what can you do? What can you do at your nation? What can you do as a person? For those of us who have inherent and treaty rights, we have an inherent responsibility Stewards of the land, you know, we talked about that. Stewards of the water, we have, a, we have a collective and a nation responsibility as well. We know what that's supposed to be, right? What can we all do? If we all knew the process, wouldn't we be able to just coexist in a little bit more peace? If they would just quit imposing on our jurisdiction and authority, or our sovereign nation's jurisdiction authority? That sovereignty, we already entered into a uh, relationship. We are already sovereign. We don't need Alberta to say, you're sovereign under our sovereignty act. Right? So yeah, uh, it says law development. I will, I will admit that. I will say that. We are working with our elders to teach and educate what those natural laws were, are still today. They're in our languages. So for those of us who don't speak or understand our languages, it's a different interpretation. It's a different understanding. When I translate Cree into English, it totally takes the meaning away. Um, so with that, do you have any questions for Gwen?